Um, we typically think of three different eating disorders, anorexia nervosa, bulimia nervosa, and binge eating disorder. Anorexia nervosa is characterized by excessive weight loss, so people get down to a very low weight, um, but often they still perceive themselves as large. Women with anorexia will often stop having their periods, um, and even though we see them as being very emaciated, sometimes they'll look into the mirror and they'll still see themselves as overweight. Anorexia nervosa afflicts about 1% of the population. Bulimia is more common. We see that in around 2%. And binge eating disorder is actually the most prevalent eating disorder. And we see that in over 3% of the population. Now, these are diagnosed eating disorders. If we broaden it out and look at people who have symptoms of eating disorders, those numbers go up even higher. So somewhere around 10% of the female population has some symptoms of an eating disorder. For a long time, we've been under the misperception that eating disorders were caused by sociocultural factors, like women trying hard to diet down to an unrealistic body size. But what we found out in the past couple decades through a lot of the research that we've done, as well as other people around the world, is that genetics actually plays a central role in risk for anorexia nervosa, bulimia nervosa, and binge eating disorder. And of course, genes don't act alone. So we know that it probably is actually an interaction between genetic factors and environmental factors. And one of the ways we look at it is that you have a genetic predisposition, but it's the environment that leads to the expression of that disorder. So one of the things that I often say is genes load the gun, but it's the environment that pulls the trigger. The official statistics are that anorexia nervosa and bulimia nervosa occur at about nine times more frequently in women than men. But when we really go in and ask the questions more broadly, we see that more men are afflicted, and it's just that their symptoms might be different. They might be focused more on getting their body fat down rather than getting to a certain weight. So we actually have to think about how do we define eating disorders in men, because we do see them. And for binge eating disorder, we know that the sex ratio is actually more equal. So we're almost seeing as much binge eating disorder in men as we see in women. Eating disorders are often comorbid with other problems. So someone might not just have anorexia or bulimia. Most commonly what we see is depression as well as anxiety disorders. In fact, most people with anorexia nervosa have had an anxiety disorder even in childhood before they ever developed anorexia nervosa. The treatments for the different eating disorders vary somewhat. For anorexia nervosa, obviously the most important thing, the first step, is to gain weight because it's very hard to engage someone in psychotherapy when their brain is not properly nourished. So the first step is often just nutritional rehabilitation. Sometimes this means inpatient hospitalization to get a person up to a healthy weight so that we can really engage more in psychotherapy. And then after the weight restoration, we can engage more in cognitive behavioral therapy or dialectical behavioral therapy. And often we'll work with the family so with younger patients, we'll bring in the parents and sometimes even the siblings. And then with older patients, we'll often bring in the partner or the spouse. So part of this is really just getting the family support that patients need in order to succeed on their treatment journey. So for bulimia nervosa, we can usually treat bulimia on an outpatient basis. And the treatment of choice for bulimia nervosa is cognitive behavioral therapy. And what that therapy does is it goes in and it looks at the unhealthy cognitions that lead to and maintain bulimic behavior. And we help people evaluate them and replace them with healthier thoughts that then lead to healthier behavior. And we also use cognitive behavioral therapy in the treatment of binge eating disorder. But sometimes we have two goals in the treatment of binge eating disorder. One is to reduce the binge eating, or actually to become abstinent from binge eating. And then the second one is a healthy approach to weight control. And often both patients and therapists together will wor work toward both of these goals simultaneously. So we know when we treat adolescents that treating them with family members really helps outcome. 
And we've been watching more adults with anorexia nervosa come to our program at UNC. And we've asked the question, how can we leverage the families to treat these adults with eating disorders? And what we've found is that partners and spouses desperately want to help, but they don't know how. So we've developed a whole new treatment called UCAN, Uniting Couples in the Treatment of Anorexia Nervosa, in which we work with the partners together toward recovery from anorexia nervosa. So over the past two years, we've put together the Genetic Consortium for Anorexia Nervosa. This is now 16 countries that have united to pull together all of the DNA samples of people with anorexia nervosa that exist on the planet. We're now taking those DNA samples and we have funding from the Wellcome Trust in the United Kingdom and they're doing genome-wide association studies on those DNA samples. What that means is we're going to be able to look at the entire genome of people with anorexia nervosa to begin to start to identify genes that might influence risk for this potentially lethal disorder. Once we identify genes, then we can actually start to work backwards to start to understand the underlying biology of anorexia nervosa. We know that anorexia is caused by genetic factors, but we haven't unlocked the biology yet. Once we have genes in our pocket, then we can work backwards to start to understand the pathways that might place someone at risk biologically. What excites me the most is that genetics is really the next frontier in understanding anorexia nervosa. We can look at both human genetics as well as animal models to finally understand what some of the underlying biology is that puts someone at risk for developing anorexia nervosa.